Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about astronomy in the first half of the 20th century, give a little background to our discovery, and then talk about the discovery and uh, several things that happened at about the same time, some of which I only discovered much later. Well, as we've heard, prior to the 20th century, uh, cosmology was really, or astronomy was really a, the investigation of what we now know are components of the universe. And there was no attempt to a study, to study the whole universe as we know it. Uh, Einstein published General Relativity in uh, 1915, and that established a framework for thinking about the whole, whole universe. There was one cosmological fact at the time, that is Olber's paradox, that when you look out in the, sky, the night sky, it's dark. If we lived in a static, infinite universe, no matter what direction you look, you would see the photosphere of a star, and therefore the sky would be bright. So uh, Einstein ignored that. He had no reason to suspect that the universe was expanding. His theory predicted that the universe was unstable, so he put in the cosmological constant as we've heard about it. One extra term in general relativity, which had no other reason for being, but produced a actually unstable equilibrium in which the universe could be static. Uh, not a very likely uh, final theory. Einstein later discovered it, uh, uh, claimed this was his biggest blunder. Well, fortunately, not long later, uh, Hubble uh, discovered that the universe is actually expanding. He discovered that some of the blobs in the universe that we thought were just uh, other collections of gas are actually other galaxies very much like the Milky Way. Um, <clears throat> and in 1929, uh, he announced that uh, this law of uh, redshift increasing with distance. Um, that's his diagram. You see a lot of dots on it. Looks a lot, a lot like a lot of um, astronomical uh, data where it's really sort of a scatter diagram. He drew a straight line through it because if we take the cosmological principle that the universe should be the same everywhere, a linear expansion is the only thing which solves that problem. Unfortunately, Hubble didn't sample a large enough piece of the universe and the Hubble constant derived from this diagram is about five times too large, which means that he got an age of the universe which is actually less than the age of the Earth. And uh, geologists already understood the age of the Earth, uh, and so that, of course, was a big problem. And it may have been partly in response to that that the steady state theory was invented, because in that case, of course, objects inside the universe can be older than what you would determine from the present expansion rate of the universe. Here's a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, just so you know what a galaxy is. Uh, we would be living about two-thirds of the way out uh, on that, on an unremarkable star. Um, when we look out, we see the solar system, which has been beautifully described in the last talk. Um, we see uh, what we can interpret as a galaxy a lot like Andromeda. We see other galaxies. Uh, many of them are in clusters. Um, and all of this structure that I've described is gravitationally bound. So none of it partakes of the expansion of the universe. Uh, in investigating uh, these objects in more detail, uh, by the middle of the century, people understood that there was need for some sort of dark matter, that the gravitational effect was larger than could be explained by the brightness of stars that were seen. Now, switching subjects. John Pierce was a brilliant man who worked at Bell Labs, a uh, polymath, actually. He uh, worked with Claude Shannon on communication theory. He worked out the theory of producing an electron beam for a traveling wave tube, and he wrote science fiction. I think probably the latter explains the fact that he was the first person to publish a paper suggesting that 
a communication satellite might be possible. Of course, he was at Bell Labs where that would be an interesting thing. So when Sputnik was launched, he, of course, was invigorated, and Bell Labs got very interested. Uh, NASA, uh, as an early uh, launch, decided to put up the Echo Balloon, a 100-foot diameter metalized Mylar balloon. Uh, the idea was it was very light, so uh, any atmosphere in the orbit or anything else could affect it greatly, and you could have a very good probe of uh, the, the lifetime of satellites. Um, Bell Labs looked at it differently. This large, aluminized sphere, as well as being a good radar, radar target for, for tracking, could also reflect uh, communication signals, and they proposed to use it as a stand-in for the first satellite. Uh, the general idea that you try the simplest experiment you can first. So you would get all the Earth stations working using a dead trivial satellite, then later you put up a more complicated satellite that can actually do something. The return signal they knew would be weak, spheres scatter radiation in all directions. They decided to use two devices which had been invented at Bell Labs, not unusual to use your own devices, a traveling wave maser amplifier, which was the lowest noise amplifier available at the time. Um, it had been developed as part of a Cold War effort, as part of uh, very sensitive radar systems, but it had been done at Bell Labs. Since it was very low noise, if it had been put on an ordinary dish-shaped antenna where you have the receiver looking down at the dish and seeing some of the ground around it, its effect would have been spoiled. So they proposed to use a horn reflector antenna, which was something that was also invented at Bell Labs. In course of time, ECHO was launched. Uh, Eisenhower's voice was transmitted by JPL and received at Bell Labs Crawford Hill. And then they put up Telstar, the first active communication satellite. Here's a picture of horn reflectors, the way they were intended to be used as a microwave relay. You have two of these things, a weak signal comes in here, it's amplified, goes out on the other side, and one of the nice features of these antennas is that they have a very good rejection of signals from the back direction. The big one that was built for ECHO and that we used is the 20-foot horn reflector. You can see much more detail here. And since the receiver, is there a pointer here? It's not. The receiver is in the cabin over on the right, and you can see that it is shielded from the ground all the way out to the uh, actual reflecting surface. Uh, that curved surface on this side is actually a piece of a paraboloid. It's as though you had a really huge paraboloid. You took a cookie cutter and cut out a little piece of it and put it on the end with that horn around it. Anyway, it, it made an ideal arrangement for mounting the uh, the traveling wave maser in the cabin because you could put something big there that didn't have to move with gravity. Well, my background was that I went to Caltech as a graduate student in 1957, and during my first semester, Sputnik was launched. I had no idea what a beneficial effect that was going to have on my career. Uh, not only the fact that it led to satellites and my being hired by Bell Labs and so forth, but it led to a general enthusiasm for science and a need to catch up in the United States, which greatly improved the, uh, the job market and the situation for scientists. Um, as a student, I joined a radio astronomy group at Caltech. Uh, they had done the major construction work for an interferometer. And, uh, and I had an interest in both the astronomy and the engineering of the uh, equipment to go in it. As a graduate student, I had one cosmology course that was taught by Sir Fred Hoyle. Uh, he, he, of course, was one of the inventors of the steady state theory. And philosophically, I thought it was very nice for the same reason it was explained in an earlier talk. You know, physicists don't like a beginning and an end. It's much better to have the universe exist in all times. Well, so much for philosophy. 
In my thesis, I used one of the dishes of the interferometer to measure the Milky Way galaxy, or at least the part of it we could see. Fortunately, it's very, very thin and large diameter. So here we are sitting inside it. I pointed my antenna to one side of it and let the rotation of the Earth sweep it across. And so uh, my chart recorder, there were no computers these days, uh, would go along with a low power. It would go up as we went over the Milky Way and go back down. And uh, I ended up ripping off all these charts, putting them on a desk, putting a meter stick under it, and measuring the power above what was at the edge. But there were two obvious things. One is we're inside the Milky Way. No place I point would avoid seeing at least some of it. And the other that I noticed in passing was that always on the side, the, the power was still dropping off a little bit. So although I was able to derive information about the gas and other particles in the, in the Milky Way, in the disk of it, there was the unsatisfying feeling that I hadn't done the job right. Um, yes, I had no, no actual measurement of the brightness. So when Bell Labs offered me a job, I, I took it. Um, <clears throat> I did take a one-year postdoc at Caltech to finish up a few things. Uh, the Crawford Hill people had done much of the ECHO project and were involved in Telstar. Arno Penzias uh, had been hired a year before. He had done a radio astronomy thesis at Columbia with Charlie Towns. One might ask why Bell Labs, an industrial organization, would have uh, employed two radio astronomers, and I think there's a complicated answer to that. The, one, the answer they would have given to management was that uh, radio astronomers know about observing through the atmosphere, uh, they know about large antennas, um, how to point them, uh, all that sort of thing. But I think there's more to it than that. Uh, Carl Jansky had been in essentially the same organization uh, that ended up at Crawford Hill. He had discovered radio astronomy, but uh, had not really followed through very much. These people had now built an instrument which was unique and they thought could contribute to astronomy, and I think they wanted to, to actually contribute to astronomy. The attraction to Arno and me was that it was a unique instrument um, and that we could, could do some things that no one else could do. Um, the little horn reflector is small enough so you can calibrate it from a finite distance, but the Maser amplifier made it sensitive enough to compete with other uh, larger antennas. Well, we set out a series of projects to do. Uh, one of them was to measure the, uh, the brightness of some bright radio sources, especially Cas A, and do it at a frequency that was being used for satellite communication. Uh, thus, when one bought an Earth station, one could measure the signal-to-noise ratio on Cas A and know how good the Earth station was. In fact, contracts were written where the payment was based on, on just that sort of measurement. Then we wanted to look for a halo around our galaxy. In other words, fix up my thesis. And then we were going to shift, and to do that, we were going to shift to a longer wavelength, the 21 centimeter wavelength, where neutral hydrogen is observable. And we were going to do a much better search for atomic hydrogen in clusters of galaxies. In other words, fix up Arno's thesis. Uh, not a surprising set of objectives for a couple of recent graduates. We started, however, with the existing 4 gigahertz system, and we could argue pretty well that the galactic halo shouldn't be there, and thus it made a good control experiment to do ahead of the, the real experiment. So we built the best measuring system we knew how to. Arno made a very good helium-cooled uh, reference noise source, and I made uh, most of the rest of the electronics, a, a good switch to compare the antenna to the 
noise source and improve the rest of the electronics. So we assembled all of this and our first measurement was a big disappointment because the antenna was making more, had more noise coming out of it than the helium and it should have been the other way around. It was about an extra three and a half degrees in there and it was just immediately apparent with the low noise receiver we had, the stable electronics, uh, there was no denying it. Um, this in fact had been seen before at Bell Labs but without the direct comparison of helium to the universe. Um, but by this time Dave Hogg, another, uh, uh, another researcher at Bell Labs and I had measured the gain of the 20-foot horn reflector. We had actually hired a helicopter for a couple of days and had a source on it and done an elaborate experiment to measure just how accurate the the 20 foot horn was and what its, you know, what its pickup was. And we needed to transfer that to the sky, in other words, measure, uh, the, make the CAS A measurement. We spent about nine months uh, understanding the calibration of our receiver, doing it several ways, and making that measurement. At that point, and during that time, we kept seeing the same excess. Unless we were pointed right at the Milky Way or right at some other source, we always saw the same excess. So at the end of that nine months, uh, we, uh, we decided to do some more investigation into our system. Uh, we did so and still couldn't find anything. Um, <clears throat> We, as you've probably heard, had a pair of pigeons living in the antenna. So among other things, we swept out the pigeon droppings. We taped up the joints. Uh, we did everything we could think of. Uh, we had one experiment yet let, left to go when one day Arno happened to talk to Bernie Burke, a well-known radio astronomer at MIT. As it happened, uh, Arno had been on an airplane with Bernie uh, sometime before going to a meeting in Canada and Bernie was asking him what two young astronomers at Bell Labs were going to do and Arno outlined uh, our proposal. Bernie had said, uh, the galactic halo doesn't exist, you're wasting your time. Anyway, <clears throat> on this fateful day, Arno called Bernie and uh, they had talked about whatever they called about. Neither one of them can remember what the subject of the call is. But at the end, Bernie said, uh, how's your silly experiment going? Or crazy experiment, I think he said. And Arno unloaded on him all the, all the things we'd tried and how it wasn't working. Uh, we couldn't get our control experiment to work. And Bernie said, I think you ought to call Bob Dickey at Princeton. They're working on something that might interest you. Well, the background to that is that uh, Bernie had a good friend, Ken Turner, uh, when they had worked together at the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism in, um, in Washington. Uh, and Ken had gone to a talk at Johns Hopkins uh, where he heard uh, a talk by Jim Peebles about cosmology. Uh, Bob Dickey at Princeton had proposed uh, that if we lived in a, an oscillating universe, with repeated Big Bangs, the Big Bangs would have to be hot and as the universe expanded the radiation would cool but still should be there. Uh, so Arno called Dickey and uh, the report from the other end is that they were having a bag lunch in Dickey's office. Uh, Dickey picked up the phone and they heard things like uh, atmospheric radiation, sky noise, antenna temperature, all the things they were working about. Dickie put down the phone and said, boys, we've been scooped. I think if L Labs had a good enough reputation that he believed right away that if we said we'd done something, we had done it. Anyway, they came out uh, shortly afterward for a visit and uh, uh, were impressed, I think, with the hardware they saw and what we had measured. Um, and then they told us about the ideas of the Big Bang. Arno and I were 
as you might imagine, happy to have some sort of an explanation and certainly happy to publish it now that we, there was some possibility of understanding what we had seen. But neither one of us took the cosmology very seriously at first. Uh, at that point, cosmology, I don't think it ever explained anything or, or predicted anything that you could go and measure. Uh, so we wrote two separate papers. We wrote a page and a half about our measurement, and uh, they wrote a, a, a summary of the calculations that Jim Peebles had made. We made our last check. We took a Hewlett-Packard signal generator and a standard horn, used it as a transmitter, transmitted to the horn reflector from other parts of Crawford Hill just to check that there wasn't some pickup that was not expected. Uh, it showed just about what we expected. Before these papers actually came out in print, however, um, the, there was a leak from the Astrophysical Journal to Walter Sullivan, one of the, well, he was the best science reporter at the New York Times at the time. And he wrote a front page story about our measurements with a picture of our 20-foot horn. And that convinced me that the rest of the world was taking the cosmology seriously, and maybe I better start taking it seriously, too. Five minutes. Okay, this is going to be tight. <laughs> so the first confirmation came very quickly from uh, measurements of CN, a, a simple radical in space which had been made much earlier. From um, the, They were seen in absorption in front of starlight, and both the ground state and the first excited state had been seen. Uh, from the intensity ratio, uh, one could calculate a temperature. That temperature was calculated, and in the standard book on the interstellar medium, um, that was given as 2.3 degrees with very little meaning attached to it. Um, the same Bernie Burke told George Field about our measurement. George, while a graduate student or a postdoc at Princeton, had made a calculation about the CN, had written up a paper saying that there must be a local radiation density which is causing this, and he, uh, he showed it to uh, uh, Lyman Spitzer, the grand old man of interstellar medium, who said, I wouldn't stick my neck out that far. You don't know the dipole moment. Anyway, George threw away the paper and went on. Uh, but when he first, when he heard about this, he then immediately knew uh, that 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 would be a measurement of the of the background. It happened there was a person next to him in the next office who was making such measurements at the time, and they were able to say that the temperature was the same in different parts of the galaxy. By the end of the year, Roland Wilkinson at Princeton had made a measurement at three centimeters, and uh, by a year after our publication, uh, the black body curve was pretty well established in the Rayleigh genes region before the turnover. Well, the theory wasn't new. Uh, George Gamow and his associates, Ralph, Ralph Alpher and Herman, had been uh, calculating um, element generation in the early universe, dealing with the Big Bang universe, and they at one point predicted 5 Kelvin for the temperature, but their physics was uh, completely spurious as far as the element generation. They later fixed up the physics but didn't mention the, the 5 Kelvin. So uh, science doesn't always go in a straightforward way. There were at least five near misses for this discovery. The original CN uh, could have been um, but people didn't know enough about the interstellar medium at the time. Gamow, Alpha, and Herman, I believe, could have made a measurement. The first measurement at Princeton used technology which would have been available to them at the time, but they didn't do it. Ed Ohm at Bell Labs had made careful measurements of the 20-foot horn reflector at a different wavelength, and in his paper he said he saw 3.1 Kelvin more than he expected, but the errors in his measurement he thought were enough that he didn't have to worry about it. George Field was on the trail. He was discouraged by an expert. And there was a Russian paper 
suggesting the importance of checking on this. They saw Ed Ohm's paper, they misinterpreted it, and thought that the radiation temperature of the universe was zero. So that put the steady state theory to rest. Uh, I think it was dying anyway. Um, I believe that our that this change in paradigm was accepted rather rapidly as such things go. Often you need a new generation of physicists before something like this really takes hold. Um, <clears throat> but I think at that point cosmology gained a new observable uh, which made a real difference. And in the time from then till now, uh, cosmology has turned into a real science. I believe that Martin Rees will now tell us uh, about the progress that's been made since then. Thank you.